And so we need to reach the Gentiles so that we can get this whole thing moving with the Jewish people. <laughs> you know, so Gentiles, Share hurry up, <laughs> hurry up. You know, the, the person I want to meet the most is the last Gentile. Send me their address. I will fly wherever they are in the world, meet them, share the gospel with them. It's such a privilege to be here in the Emmanuel Center in the heart of Westminster for Chosen People Ministries Conference, Finding Shalom in a Troubled World. And we're joined today by Dr. Mitch Glazer, who is head of Chosen People. God bless you. Welcome to London. Thank you. Big shalom. Big Fergus. shalom. Nice to be here. Wonderful. Uh, why Finding Shalom? Well, because we live in a troubled world, because culturally, morally, philosophically, theologically even, uh, both within the church and outside the church, we're experiencing incredible disruption. Uh, look at Israel. Israel is a, a wonderful country formed in 1948, the current state of Israel. And uh, things are, I mean, ever wonder why there's a new prime minister every other week, you know? And and so in Israel, in all of in Britain yes. and the United States, yes. there's just so much, uh, so much turbulence, really. And we live in a troubled world. And the way to navigate a troubled world world, of course, is to follow Yeshua, to follow Man. Jesus, but to have our feet firmly planted in the Word of God. Yes. And from my perspective, and this is why I think we, we brought this event to the UK, and we're doing some of these conferences in the US as well, and it's, it's almost a form of cultural apologetics. It's showing brothers and sisters how they can navigate a troubled world by understanding scriptures, and then understanding that the non-believers are watching. Yes. And so they're looking at us. Yes. And so we need, they're going to see how Jesus helps us navigate a troubled world by what we do, what we say, how we raise our children, how we respond to difficulty. And so it's very important for proclamation of the gospel Amen. to be able to navigate these troubled worlds. Now, Mitch, at at your heart, you have a PhD, you are an author, you're a proper studier of the Word of God. But at your heart, you're, a, you're an evangelist. Oh, yeah. You have a passion to share the truth of Yeshua, the Messiah, with the Jewish people. Where did that come from and how does it outwork itself in your life? Oh, Fergus, that's an easy one <laughs> because, uh, because almost a little over 50 years ago, November 1970, Amen. I gave my heart to Jesus. Amen. And I was a 19-year-old kid. Uh, I was raised in a modern Orthodox Jewish home, though not very religious, but everything I knew about Judaism was Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I became, I went from being a good Jewish boy to bad Jewish boy, unfortunately, for me and for my parents. And uh, so I, I was doing drugs, I was selling drugs, I was a lousy, lousy kid to be honest. And then I was an empty kid yes, because everything I was doing was not leading yeah. to peace in a troubled yeah. world. Yeah. It was leading to trouble in a troubled world. Yes, And so my two best friends became believers in Jesus. And what I saw was their lives transformed. And it wasn't just that they saw that Jesus was the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. I don't think any of us knew anything about messianic prophecy at the time. They became gentler, kinder, more reasonable. They stopped doing drugs. They smiled more. They were happy. You know, just all the obvious stuff that happens when you come to the Lord. And it was so attractive to me. And so I asked God to show me the truth. Make a long story short, I found a New Testament in a phone booth in the middle of the Redwood Forest, glowing in the moonlight. A lot of things were glowing at that time, Fergus, for me, <laughs> understandably. But this was really glowing. And I picked it up and I didn't know what it was because wow. being raised in a Jewish home, I was six years from my bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. which, is, which we can explain later, but I just knew nothing about the New Testament. I, I had no idea. I didn't know who wrote it. Mm -hmm. And so the chapter said Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. I said, these are weird names for chapters. I have no idea who these people are. But there were little pictures in this Good News for Modern Man. And one of them was with somebody with long hair like me. Yeah. And I looked at this and I said, wow, you know, that must be Jesus. Oh. And 
I related to Jesus as sort of a, a hippie, but he still wasn't Jewish for me. So I began reading the, the New Testament. Jesus celebrated Passover, yes. not, not Easter. He celebrated Hanukkah, not Christmas. And it became clear to me that my spiritual battle, which I was having really, it was raging, was between me and another Jewish person. Mm. And so my friends said that Jesus made all the difference to them. Now I was meeting Jesus, the Jew, and sort of the hippie, <laughs> the nonconformist, you know, and the ultimate nonconformist. And, and I said, wow, I, I thought he would be the, the fountain of anti-Semitic beliefs and activity. And, and, and he wasn't. Nah, and he isn't. He was one of us. Amen. And so I accepted the Lord. And you know, I remember the next morning I woke up and I two things I understood. Number one, I had no interest in drugs anymore. So I was delivered as I slept. Wow. Never touched a drug again. Wow. Well, some Tylenol once in a while, but but never touched a drug again. And I really I was willing to give up being Jewish wow. in order to believe in Jesus. That's how yeah. distorted my thinking was. But I realized, wait a minute, how do you even stop being Jewish? I didn't think that through. So I was definitely Jewish. In fact, I felt more Jewish Man. because now I was interest, more interested in reading the Bible. Yes. And uh, in the Bible were all my heroes like Abraham and David. We used to sing songs about them growing up. And there they were in the Bible. Amen. I thought they were just in the songs. And so why am I an evangelist? Because I want other people to find what I found. In your role with Chosen People Ministries, you both sponsor and encourage missionaries, those that go from one place to another to join Jewish communities, embed themselves in amongst the culture and share the good news of Yeshua. Yes. Many of us have lost that passion for mission sending. What does it really mean? Oh boy, that's a great question, Fergus. Uh, it, it, it means hardship, sorrow, and incredible joy. Uh, because you have to work with people. It's not easy particularly to bring a family into a new place to learn a new language, to learn new culture. And so there's a lot of hardship along the way. There's raising the funds, and then you're talking to someone who does this in a very pragmatic level. And so getting them out there and then nurturing them Amen. in the new culture and helping them learn. And in particular, Chosen People sends most of its missionaries to Israel, which means that most of the people we send to Israel are Jewish. So they don't have to learn about what it means to be Jewish, but they do need to learn what it's like to be Israeli, mm. to learn Hebrew and their kids learn Hebrew. Now, if they're young and they go to the Hebrew public schools, they speak Hebrew better than the parents within six months, you know, no matter how much the parents try. But it's very important to nurture people to do that. And, and I would say, can I, can I quote something from Romans 11? Please. Okay. It's a very... I want to speak about missions to Gentiles mm. for a moment. So in Romans chapter 11, Paul gives us a lot of hope for the salvation of Israel, particularly beginning at verse 25, where he says, in that day all Israel will be saved. We know that the nation of Israel will turn to Jesus at the end of days, and Jesus will return. That's the, that's, we don't know when, but we know the process. Yes. When the Jews turn to Jesus, Jesus returns, right? And that's in many other portions of scripture, Matthew 23, verses, verses 37 through 39, when you say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then, then Jesus is going to return. So the Jewish people were not just important to the first coming. The Jewish people are profoundly important to the second coming. And so, but in that passage, Paul says that the first thing that happens is that the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. What does that mean? The fullness of the Gentiles will come in and then, or thus, all Israel will be saved. So how's that time clock working? How, what's the chart? What's happening? First, the Gentiles need to come to faith. And then when that happens, or all the Gentiles that will come to faith will come to faith. Jesus said, work, work while it's light because the darkness is coming. And so we need to reach the Gentiles 
so that we can get this whole thing moving with the Jewish people. <laughs> you know, so Gentiles, Share hurry your face. up, <laughs> hurry up. You know, the, the person I want to meet the most is the last Gentile. Send me their address. I will fly wherever they are in the world, meet them, share the gospel with them. But we need to work on this together in partnership. We need to see Gentiles reach for Jesus. And then God is going to work in a very powerful way among the Jewish people. And then Jesus returns and then our work is over. Talk to me about sharing your faith with the young people in Israel. Israel is the oldest church and the youngest church because Israel, uh, it began in Israel, 33 AD, give or take a year. Give or right? take. Okay. So it began in Israel. And a reluctant group of Jewish disciples went into the world and began sharing the gospel. So we, we, we know that is true. However, um, it began, it then became a Muslim country, and it wasn't exactly open and free for the proclamation of the gospel. The Jews were always there, and they began trickling back, but the modern state of Israel was not established until 1948. In those early years, there were very few Israeli Jewish believers, and they were not born in Israel for the most part. They came from Europe or from the United States. The Jesus movement swept through Israel just like it swept through the United States. You can date it at 1967 when Jerusalem mm. was reunited. But God poured out his spirit. And Fergus, actually, there was a vital, dynamic, messianic Jewish movement in Europe between the wars, between Amen. World War I and yeah. World War II. But all of these Jewish people got saved in Eastern Europe where there were 12 million Jewish people. They were killed in the Holocaust, mm. almost all of them. We lost all our young people. We lost our leaders. We lost our scholars. And so the movement was dormant almost. And then it began happening in the U.S. and in Canada and Australia and South Africa. And then all of a sudden, Israel pops on the scene. And slowly but surely, Jewish believers were coming to Israel. Congregations were being forward, formed. My first trip was 1976 to Israel. There were maybe a half a dozen Israeli wow. national congregations. Now there's 150, 160. There were maybe less than 500 believers. Now there's probably 25 or 30,000 believers. And we now have a movement of the Holy Spirit among second generation Israelis. Why is this a big deal? Because we never had a first generation in Israel. That started in 1948. And now we've got a second generation. Amen. They've been through Israeli schools, mm. these young people. They've been through the army. They know the Lord. And Chosen People Ministries has created a center in the greater Tel Aviv area in an urban suburb called Ramat Gan that is really happening. I got to tell you, uh, I've been there. We're, we're seeing hundreds of Israeli young people come to conferences, concerts, Bible teaching. Of course, we do have good food. So, you know, that natural and good coffee that comes. Good coffee. And so they're coming and they're bringing their unsafe friends. And this is growing and growing. And so I'm really excited about the future for Israel. You know, in, in a sense, I see that day coming when all Israel will be saved. But Paul said that how could they hear unless they've been sent? How could they hear without a preacher? And so we need to send people, we need to help people get there, and we need to encourage the believers that are there, that God would send them into this great harvest field that's really ripe for harvest. Not We know every field can be ripe, yeah. but not every field is ripe, but this one is ripe. So pray for the Jewish people in Israel, because God's doing something special in these last days. Mitch, before we let you go, will you pray for our God TV family that they too would know that peace that comes from that wonderful hippie, Jewish Jesus? <laughs> let me pray. Abba Father, we love you. We thank you for the salvation that we can have simply by putting our trust in you because you're the one that did everything for us. Lord, uh, we thank you that you sent your son in fulfillment of prophecy to die for our sins. 
but he rose from the dead and he crushed death. And Lord, I thank you that we have new life through him. I pray for the God TV family, for all those who are listening. And Lord, we know that some folks out there are either struggling with their faith or they haven't yet put their faith or trust in you. Lord, I pray that even at this very moment, you might open their hearts and reveal yourself to them. And I pray, Lord, that they might find you to be their savior and their Lord and give their lives to you. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, help them to see how much you love them and give them the peace that passes all understanding, peace in a troubled world, Lord, so that they're able to be uh, a role model and an example to others, like my friends were a role model for me. I pray this all in the wonderful name of Yeshua. Amen. Dr. Mitch Glazer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Fergus.